All right, so uh, welcome everyone. And I'm going to talk more about uh, what it takes to become a multi planet species. Um, and I, just, a, just a brief refresher on why this is important. I think fundamentally, the future is vastly more exciting and interesting if we're a space faring civilization and a multi planet species than if we're not. Uh, it, you want to be inspired by things. You want to wake up in the morning and think the future is going to be great. Uh, and that's what. Uh, what being a spacefaring civilization is all about. It's about believing in, in the future and, and thinking that the future will be better than the past. Um, and I can't think of anything more exciting than going out there and being among the stars. You know, in, in last year's presentation, you know, we're really searching for what the right way, you know, how, how do we pay for this thing? We went through various ideas, a Kickstarter, you know, collecting underpants. Um, these didn't pan out. Um, but, but now we think, we, we think, we think we've got a way to do it, uh, which is to have, a, to have a smaller vehicle, still pretty big, um, but one that can serve, that w w where the, the, w one that can do everything that's needed in, in the greater Earth orbit activity. So essentially, we want to make our current vehicles redundant. So let's see. What progress have we made in, in, this, in this direction? So last, last time you saw the giant tank, that's actually a 12-meter tank. Um, and you can see the relative scale of it. it it's 1,000 cubic meters of volume inside. That's actually more uh, pressurized volume than an A380, just to put that into perspective. Uh, we developed a new carbon fiber matrix that's much stronger and more capable at cryo than anything before. And it holds 1,200 tons of liquid oxygen. So we, we tested it. Uh, so we successfully tested it up to uh, its design pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and then went a little further. Um, so we wanted to see where, where it would break. And um, we, we found out where it would break. It, uh, shot about 300 feet into the air and landed in the ocean. Uh, we, met, we fished it out, and, uh, but we've now got a pretty good sense of what it takes to create a huge carbon fiber tank that can hold cryogenic liquid. Um, the, the, the next key element is on the engine side. We have to have an extremely efficient engine. So the, the, the Raptor engine uh, will, will be the highest thrust-to-weight engine, we believe, of, of any, any engine of any kind ever made. Uh, we, we already have now 1,200 seconds of firing across 42 main engine tests. Uh, we fired it for 100 seconds. It could, it could fire for much longer than 100 seconds. That's just the, the, the size of the, uh, of the test tanks. Um, and then the, the, the duration of the firing you're seeing right now is, is 40 sec about 40 seconds, which is the length of the firing for landing on Mars. So in order to land on, pla on places like the moon, where there is no atmosphere uh, and certainly no runways, um, or to land on Mars, where the atm atmosphere is too thin to land, on, even if there were runways, to land with, with a wing, uh, you really have to get pro propulsive landing perfect. So that's what we've been practicing with Falcon 9. Uh, so this is just a, a series of, of landing videos. I think these are quite mesmerizing. But we, we now have 16 successful landings in a row. And that's with, um, um, but just for, for those who aren't familiar with how many orbital launches occur every year, it's approximately, approximately 60 orbital launches occur per year, which means if, if SpaceX does do something like 30 launches next year, it'll be approximately half of all orbital launches that occur on Earth. Uh, this gives you sort of a rough sense of, of rocket capability, starting off at the low end with the Falcon 1 at a half ton, and then going up to BFR at 150. So it, I think it's important to note that the BFR uh, has 
more capably than Saturn V, um, even with full reusability. But, but here's the, here's the really, really important fundamental point. Let's look at the launch cost. The, the, order, the order reverses. Now, now, at first glance, this may seem ridiculous, but, but it's not. The, the same is true of aircraft. If you, want to, if you, if you bought, say, a, a, a small single-engine turboprop aircraft, that would be one and a half to two million dollars. Um, to charter a 747 from California to Australia is half a million dollars. There and back. The single engine turboprop can't even get to Australia. Um, so a fully reusable system, like so a fully reusable giant aircraft like a 747, costs a third as much as an expendable tiny aircraft. In, in one case, you have to build an entire aircraft. In the other case, you just have to refuel something. So it's, it's, it's really crazy that we build these sophisticated rockets and then crash them every time we fly. This is, this is mad. I, it, so um, yeah, is the, the, this is, this is, I can't um, emphasize how profound this is and how important reusability is. The, the size of, of this being a nine meter diameter vehicle is, is a huge enabler for new satellites. Uh, we can actually send something uh, that is almost nine meters in diameter uh, to orbit. Um, so for example, for, if you want to do a new Hubble, um, you could send a, a mirror that has 10 times the surface area of the current Hubble as a single unit. It doesn't have to unfold or anything. And, um, or, or, or you can send a large number of small satellites. You can, you can do whatever you like. Um, you can actually also go around and, if you wanted to collect old satellites or clean up space debris, you can just use the sort of chomper over there um, and go around and collect, uh, collect satellites or collect space debris if you want. Um, so that, that, may, that may be something we have to do in the future. Um, but th that, that, that fairing would open up and retract and, and come back down. So it's, it enables launching of, of Earth satellites uh, that are significantly larger than anything we've done before, or significantly more satellites at a time than anything that's been done before. Uh, it's also intended to be able to service the, the space station. I, I know it looks a little big relative to the space station, <laughs> um, but the, the shuttle also looked big. Um, so it, it, it'll, it'll work. <laughs> looks a little outsized, but it'll work. Um, so it's, it'll, it'll be capable of, of um, doing what Dragon does today in terms of transporting cargo and what Dragon 2 will do in, uh, in terms of transporting crew and cargo. So it can do the space station servicing. Um, it can also go obviously much further than that, um, like for example the moon. Um, based on the calculations we've done, uh, we can actually do lunar surface missions with no propellant production on the surface of the moon. So if we do a high elliptic uh, parking orbit uh, for, uh, for the ship and retank in a high elliptic orbit, we can go all the way to the moon and back with no local propellant production on the moon. So I think that, 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 enabled, that would enable the creation of moon base alpha or, or some sort of lunar base. Um, Becoming a multi-planet species. Piece the hell of, out of being a single planet species. So, um, yeah, so we'd start off by sending a mission to, to Mars, where it would be obviously just landing on rocky ground or dusty ground. Um, and it's, it's the same approach that I mentioned before, which is you send the spaceship up to orbit, you retank it or refill it until it has full tanks. 
um, and um, it travels to Mars, lands on Mars. Um, for Mars, you will need local propellant production. But Mars has a CO2 atmosphere and plenty of water ice. That gives you CO2 and H2O. So you've got, you can make, therefore, CH4 and O2. Criticism for why, why are you using combustion in rockets when you have electric cars? You're like, well, there isn't some way to make an electric rocket. I wish there was. Um, but um, in the long term, you can use solar power to, to extract CO2 from the atmosphere, combine it with water, and produce uh, uh, fuel and oxygen for the rocket. So the same thing that we would do on Mars, uh, we could do on Earth uh, in the long term. So this is the, the true physics simulation. Um, this will last about a, a minute. Um, so you come in, you're entering very quickly, going seven and a half kilometers a second. Um, for Mars, there will be some ablation of the heat shield. So it's just like a sort of brake pad wearing away. Um, it, it is a multi-use heat shield, but unlike for Earth operations, um, it's coming in um, hot enough that you really do, you will see some wear of the heat shield. But because Mars has an atmosphere, albeit not a particularly dense one, you can remove almost all the energy uh, aerodynamically. Uh, and we've proven out supersonic retropropulsion many times with, uh, with Falcon 9, so we feel very comfortable about that. Um, the, the, this is a, because it's sort of, um, you can see it's sort of a, a, a mesh system. It's not, it's not meant to be sort of particularly pretty because it's just trying to simulate the physics of it. Uh, but the, the size of the cone gives you a rough approximation for how much thrust the engines are producing. Fairly confident that we can complete the ship and be ready for a launch in about five years. Five years seems like a long time to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I, the, the area under the curve of, of resources over that period of time should enable this time frame to be met. Um, but if not this time frame, I think pretty soon thereafter. Uh, but that's, that's, our, that's our goal, is to try to um, make the 2022 uh, Mars rendezvous. Uh, so then in 2024, uh, we want to try to fly four ships, uh, two of which would be crewed, and two, of which, two, two cargo and, and two, two crew. Um, the, the goal of, 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 the, uh, of these initial missions is to, is to find the best source of water. That's for the first mission. And then the second mission, the goal is to build the, the propellant plant. So we should, uh, with, particularly with six ships, there uh, have plenty of landed mass to construct the propellant depot, uh, which will consist of a large array of solar panels, very large array, um, and then everything necessary to mine and refine uh, water, and then draw the CO2 out of the atmosphere, uh, and then create and store uh, deep cryo CH4 and O2. Then build up the base, starting obviously with one, one ship, then multiple ships, then start building out the city, then making the city bigger, <laughs> even bigger. <laughs> Um, if, you, if you build a ship that's capable of going to Mars, well, well, what if you take that same ship and go from one place to another on Earth? So we, we looked at that, and the results are quite interesting.
Mountain. Um, so, so, yeah, so the, the, the great thing about going to space is there's no friction. So uh, once you're out of the atmosphere, you will go, it will be smooth as silk, no turbulence, nothing. There's no weather, there's no, there's no atmosphere. And uh, you can get to, to most long distance places, like I said, in less than half an hour. Um, and if we're building this thing to go to the moon and Mars, then why not go to other places on Earth as well? All right, thank you. You want, mate?